Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Vasquez. My colleague, Judy Peterson, is here. If you need anything from the press releases or the lawsuit itself, uh, please uh, um, go to Judy. She's got the press release and the complaint there for you. Uh, we also have some uh, holiday ride-sharing safety tips. If any of you want to do a feature story down the road here, given that it is the holiday season, uh, Judy has those safety tips that are available uh, along with the URL for the website. Uh, Mr. Mike Baumberger is the attorney who has filed these lawsuits against Lyft. Uh, we also have uh, some of the victims that were named in the lawsuit here as well. Uh, they are standing to my left and to my right along with the victim advocates for SD and Baumberger, which is the law firm that is bringing forth this lawsuit against Lyft. So with that, let me introduce Mr. Mike Baumberger and he will take over. This morning we filed a lawsuit in San Diego Superior, in, this morning we filed a lawsuit in San Francisco Superior Court on behalf of 20 women that were sexually assaulted or raped in Lyft vehicles. This lawsuit claims that Lyft has concealed and hidden the staggering number of assaults and rapes that occur in their vehicles. Lyft has known about this problem for the last five years, and they've done nothing to fix it. Instead, Lyft has made a concerted effort in the media, in litigation, and in criminal cases to try to hide the number of assaults and rapes that occur in their vehicles. Additionally, Lyft has allowed drivers that have sexually assaulted and raped their customers and their passengers to, to continue driving under their app and platform. This lack of zero tolerance policy encourages sexual predators to join the Lyft platform. Lyft could adopt policies that mandate anytime there's a crime that they're aware of that occurs in their vehicles that those crimes are reported to the police. But Lyft doesn't do this. Lyft could let drivers know that they're being recorded digitally and that they're watching so that these assaults don't occur, but they don't do this. Lyft could immediately suspend any driver that has an accusation of assault or rape levied against them and remove them from the app, but they don't do this. Lyft could also make it easy for police to apprehend the sexual predators that are on their platform, but they don't do this either. In fact, we know that in many cases, an assault has occurred and that those particular drivers are allowed to assault more than once, more than twice, before Lyft removes them from the app. Lyft could also do more thorough background checks, but they don't do this either. The bottom line is that Lyft does not take safety of their passengers seriously and never has. Lyft's message to their drivers is that safety and accountability do not exist and it's not important. The Lyft platform is tailor-made for sexual predators. On September 4th, we filed a lawsuit against Lyft on behalf of 14 sexual assault and rape victims. Within days of following this lawsuit, Lyft's public relations department rolled out a series of features that they claimed were safety oriented. However, these features were simply gimmicks and they don't work. One of the reasons we know that these don't work is because eight of the women that are part of this lawsuit had their incidents occur after these features were in play. Today we have several victims that are here to tell their stories, not because they want to, but because they want to shine a light on the Lyft platform and the predators that it allows to exist on this platform with no accountability. First, I'd like to introduce you to Caroline Miller. Caroline was out to celebrate her birthday and was raped by a Lyft driver after she tried to make the safe decision and uh, order a 
lift in order to get home safely. You'll hear her story about how she notified her, her boyfriend after the rape. You'll hear that the driver was arrested, and you'll hear that as a consequence of her assault, Lyft offered her a refund of her ride. Caroline? It was around 3 a.m. when I called Lyft to pick me up. I was still a little intoxicated when Lyft arrived, so I decided to take a nap in the back seat. A few minutes later, I woke up and I couldn't believe what was happening. He had his hand down my pants and was groping and raping me. Then he started talking about taking me to a hotel. I was freaking out. I can't tell you how scared I was, but I went along with him and told him that I needed to retrieve my inhaler out of my car before we went to a hotel. At the same time, I was desperately texting my boyfriend for help. My boyfriend called the police. They arrived on scene as soon as I was able to escape to my car and the police arrested him on the spot. This clearly shows that Lyft needs to make significant safety changes because it should not happen to anyone. I think having every ride recorded would be a strong deterrent to predator drivers. Make no mistake, these men are predators and by allowing them to drive, Lyft is fostering a vile and dangerous business practice and that is why I'm suing. They don't care about their customers, they only care about their profit. Lyft demonstrated that when they ignored my assault. The, there was no apology, no phone calls or emails, no response. The holidays are here and I can tell you that I will not be using Lyft to get around. I'm discouraging all women from using Lyft as well, but I hope those who do will take precautions. Make sure the driver who shows up is the same as the person pictured on the app. Record your ride and don't let him deter from the route to take a shortcut. Call someone when you get in the car and try to keep the conversation going throughout the ride. Remember, you can't trust Lyft to watch out for your safety as they so like to state. Next, I'd like to introduce an, another courageous woman that's here today to tell you what happened to her. Uh, she is listed in our lawsuit as Jane Doe number two, and she is also a, a rape victim of uh, one of the Lyft drivers. She will tell you that she feared for her life, but that she fought back, and as a consequence, her rapist is now in jail. She's speaking out today because she's angry and wants to make sure that Lyft is held accountable. Good morning. I'm Jane Doe number two in the lawsuit that was filed this morning. My story is about a Lyft rapist. On February 10th, 2019, I had gone out to dinner uh, for a meeting and had a few drinks. A Lyft was ordered to avoid driving home that night. I was confident I was making not only a wise decision, but a safe one by paying for Lyft to take me home. I got in the back seat of the car and was exhausted. So I turned my body to rest my head. 30 seconds into the drive, I heard my driver tell me that I looked like a sad girl. I tensed up and ignored him. That night, the Lyft driver raped me while I was in the back seat of the car. This is a very difficult topic for me, but I'm hoping that by standing up today, I can help someone else avoid having such a terrible crime happen to them. During the rape, I immediately froze and thought, of my, <clears throat> and thought to myself that the Lyft driver would kill me after he raped me. The street that was being traveled was dark and the cell reception was limited. I panicked and thought about jumping out of the vehicle as it was moving. Visions of my family flashed before my eyes and I decided then that I had to fight for my life. I fought for my life and punched and kicked the Lyft driver while the vehicle was still moving. I got out of it alive because I fought back. After the rape and fight, the Lyft driver tried throwing me from his vehicle. I fought for my life and slammed my, um, I fought for my life and he slammed my wrists in his car door while he dragged me with the vehicle. I was left in the middle of a dark street. He threw my purse, laptop, and phone out of his vehicle and proceeded to run over them in hopes that he wouldn't be found. This is who Lyft has driving their cars. 
I was left physically beaten, bruised, and cut, as well as emotionally scarred that night. The fear of walking into a house and asking for help will never leave me. The police took me to the station, and I told them what happened. At no point was I notified by Lyft that this man was taken off of the platform. My Lyft driver recently pled guilty to rape and is serving a jail sentence. Lyft gave him the opportunity to do this to me. In several years, he will be free again, and I fear he will be able to work for Lyft or Uber. For me, it's a different story. In two years and for the rest of my life, I'll be living with the painful consequences of what Lyft's failure um, for care and safety. Before he went behind bars, my rapist was brazen enough to remove his ankle bracelet while he was awaiting trial. When your rapist knows where you live and is not in jail, it leaves even the strongest with the fear of what will happen to them. It leads to panic attacks and it leads the, to the inability to trust. And it leads to days where I just wish I could curl up and never leave the house. But just like I fought back against the Lyft rapist, I'm fighting back against Lyft and I'm pushing myself to regain control of my life. I'm scared, I'm sad, and I'm angry. I'm furiously passionate about preventing this from happening to any other rider. Sexual assault is preventable and Lyft needs to try a lot harder to make their ride share safe because right now it's not. I'm here today because I want to join other women to force Lyft into making the changes necessary to protect their passengers. I'm urging all women and men who have been sexually violated by Lyft drivers to join me and please step forward. For those of you that have children, wives, mothers, friends, please think, think about this incident I just spoke about and what your loved, one, loved ones would have done. How would they have gotten out alive? Together, we can force this company to make the changes necessary to keep both passengers and drivers safe. As we're in the holiday season, I would advise passengers to avoid taking Lyft alone or at night at all costs. Take a taxi cab instead. If you do choose to take a Lyft, understand the risks that Lyft is putting you in. Next, I'd like to introduce Ashley and Joe. Ashley and Joe are lifelong sweethearts from Los Angeles, California. Ashley was assaulted by her Lyft driver just a few months ago on September 26th of this year. The driver is now in jail awaiting prosecution. Ashley and Joe, meanwhile, are trying to heal from this horrific assault that has turned their lives upside down. You will hear that Ashley's Lyft driver kidnapped her and not only kidnapped her, but kidnapped her in front of her husband. So he too has been emotionally scarred by Lyft's failure to take safety seriously. They're telling their story here today to let Lyft know in unequivocal terms that changes must be made to make their passengers safe. My husband and I met in Hawaii during the holidays of 1999. It was instantly love at first sight. We moved to California together for college and over the past 20 years, we have always been together. The best day of our lives was when we got married last year in Hawaii. Our families joined together for a beautiful ceremony that officially united our love. It's it is his love and support that's been helping me cope with what happened on that horrible night. I went out after work for a little celebration, but I hadn't eaten much that day and soon I was feeling tipsy. That's why one of my girlfriends called Lyft to give me a ride home. She thought I'd be safe. My friend also called my husband to let him know what time to expect me. I must have fallen asleep because I don't really remember much of the ride. But when I came to, the driver told me I was pretty. He asked if I was married and I said, yes, I'm married. And I held out my hand to show him my wedding ring. 
Then I guess I fell asleep again because the next thing I knew, the driver was on top of me, trying to put his tongue in, in my mouth, and, um, and he was kissing and touching me. I remember just trying to lift my hands up and push him off, and I said, get off of me, I, I have to go. And then suddenly he, something, something happened and he, he jumped out to the front seat. I was so terrified. I was feeling trapped and lost. He wouldn't tell me where we were going. I threw up in his car. I later learned that my husband had called the police and given them a description of Lyft's driver. When I woke up next, it was his sound of sirens and the flashing of police lights. My husband ran to get me. It's my hero on scene. My wife is a hard worker, so I encourage, I encourage her to go when she said her friends asked her out after work. And I was grateful when her friend called later that night to let me know that she was being driven home by Lyft. I knew her friend was looking out for her. But as the minutes ticked by, I began to worry. So I texted her friend who said, no, there was no reason for my wife to be delayed. In fact, her Lyft app said the driver had dropped her off 15 minutes earlier. So I was looking out the window, keeping an eye, eye out for her when I noticed a strange car across the street. At that point, I was relieved thinking, finally, she's home. I went outside and was walking toward the car when a man jumped out of the back seat to the front and peeled out. As he was speeding off, I saw my wife in the back seat. I couldn't believe what was happening. A stranger had just kidnapped my wife right in front of my eyes. I immediately called the police when I jumped, I jumped in my truck and I went to find her. The police and I found her and the Lyft driver about 40 minutes later. They actually weren't very far from our apartment. I can't tell you how afraid I was. I really thought I was going to lose her. This has been a horrible ordeal. No one should ever have, have the love of their life snatched away like that. My entire world imploded when I saw the Lyft driver take off with my wife to who knows where, not knowing what he had done or what he would do next. My wife and I have discussed the changes we think Lyft should make to ensure passengers are safe. First and foremost, we want all rides to be digitally recorded. We believe that if drivers know they're being recorded, that they wouldn't assault women. Also, before a driver is, is hired, he or she should be fingerprinted as part of their background check. Lyft needs to cooperate with police investigations. Since many dr drivers work for both Lyft and Uber, we'd like to see the two companies exchange information about drivers who are kick kicked off of their platforms. As a man, I want everyone to know that sexual assault is not just a woman's issue. It affects everyone around her, her husband, her family, her friends. I thought Lyft was safe. They certainly say they are, but my wife was most definitely not safe. And I don't think either of us will ever be the same again. When your loved one comes to you and says they have been sexually assaulted by their ride share driver, First, you have to believe them and tell them it's not their fault. Encourage them to speak out and put the shame where it belongs, on the driver and the company that harbors these criminals. My wife did not deserve for this to happen to her. Please come forward, speak out against these shameful ass assaults perpetrated by rideshare drivers, and let's put an end to this violence against innocent passengers. Mike is a victim. Yes. Carl Yeager, Police Foundation. <clears throat> Knowing that this kind of crime is often underreported, do you have uh, any estimates as to how widespread this is nationally in the Lyft network? Um, I wish we had more information about that. I know, based upon what we know in our uh, in our office and the number of women that have contacted us, that the numbers are in the thousands. This isn't a, this isn't a hundred. This is a, this is several thousand women. We believe have been assaulted. Um, uh, and as you said, it's a great point, is that only a small fraction of women that are assaulted come forward. And even more times when a woman has been drinking, they're less likely to report it. 
So we know, if the numbers we know, we've gotten calls from 100 different women since just September of this year about being assaulted. And, you know, that's, that's three months. Um, and we know that that is a small fraction of the number that have been assaulted. And this case is not just about uh, the women that's here before me and that have had their lives devastated. It's about all women that Lyft puts at risk for driving in their cars. Yes. Uh, Chris McCaffrey, KTV. I was wondering if you're seeking a CK specific monetary amount or unspecified damages. What's the compensation? Uh, it's unspecified damages. We're, we're seeking a number of different uh, damages that are available to our clients under the law. One is future medical care. Um, one is lost earnings, uh, one is future lost earnings, and another is uh, pain and suffering. Um, an interesting statistic that most people are not aware of is that over the, they've done studies that women that suffer sexual assault, the cost to them out of pocket over their lifetime is on average $125,000. So that's just the beginning of what we believe that these women are entitled to. It's something that each one of these women have to live with every day. Are these ladies who cross women? Uh, how many, if any, of the um, survivors are from here in the Bay Area? Anybody have a, an estimate of that? I know, I know of our clients. We have several clients from the Bay Area. In this particular lawsuit, um, do we have any? From California. From California, I believe we have four. We filed in San Francisco because this is where Lyft is incorporated and this is where they're, you know, this is where everything happens. This is where all the decisions that Lyft has made um, or are not made have occurred here in San Francisco. Specifically from the ABC 7 News, uh, I attended the first news conference. September, was it? Yes. How many, uh, how many people do you represent now? How many defendants do you represent now? This and the first lawsuit. Well, there's 14 people in our September lawsuit. We filed on behalf of another 20 in this lawsuit. Um, we represent over 100 rideshare um, passengers that have been assaulted or raped at this time. Um, our response from Lyft has been about the same as what our clients have gotten, which is uh, nothing. Uh, they, uh, any requests in order to try to determine, uh, well, let me first say we filed lawsuits against Lyft in order to try to get information, and we have not been very successful in getting any information yet. We're going to continue to fight, and we will eventually get it. Any plans to include, it sounds like the lawsuit specifics are against Lyft, any plans to include Uber or any other ride-sharing apps? Why, why Lyft, not Uber, I guess is my question. There's several different reasons why this action has been filed against Lyft and, and not Uber. Um, many of them I can't go into right now. I can tell you that we filed two cases against Lyft. Uh, we, we can anticipate that we're going to file more, and we have filed some cases against Uber as well. Yes, we'll, we will be filing more lawsuits. Um, Lyft has said that they've launched more than 15 new safety features or protect riders and drivers in the last few months, including mandatory feedback for rides, um, et cetera, and are relentless in their work to build safety in every aspect. How do you respond to that? Um, that statement um, is absurd. Lyft has used words to say we prioritize safety, we're doing this, we're doing that, but they have taken no concrete action to actually stop these assaults from occurring. If you look at the features that they are touting, many of those features in order to stop assault are that someone operates an app to, to dial 911 or something like that. We know that 95% of the women that are assaulted are usually asleep, and when they realize the assault's occurring, that the driver's already on top of them. How? 
is a woman under those circumstances going to be able to operate a, an app? And it, is that going to be the first thing they're going to do? And is the is the perpetrator going to let them sit there while they're operating an app? We know the answers to those questions, and so does Lyft. Um, those things are useless. What Lyft has to do is they have to make all rides digitally recorded. If an employee knows that their employer is watching them, they're not going to be committing crimes in the car. Lyft has to also make it a policy. If we learn that a crime occurs in our car, we're going to report it to the police. It's a crime. It's that simple. Both of those two measures would reduce the amount of sexual assaults and rapes that occur in their cars dramatically. But they haven't done that. Lyft knows that, but they haven't done it. I'd like to give a moment to the survivors if they want to comment on that as well. I can tell you that any app would not have helped me that. I'll tell you that any app feature that they have would not have helped me that night. Um, my cell reception was low. My phone wouldn't even have picked up. Um, had I been able to get to it. So anything that they have phone-based would not have worked in my case. They're pretty adamant about saying that they're relentless in working. You have one in five people, employees doing this. When I was reading that, how did that, I saw some reaction from you guys up there. Can you tell us what you were feeling? I mean, they have one in five people working for it, but what are they doing? I mean, what are they putting a drop down for the feedback? Oh, I was raped. That's my feedback to you, and what are you going to do with it? I, it's, it's absurd, and it's, it's, it's actually insulting. Um, and we all know getting to your phone, like we had said, there's no, the driver's not going to let you get to your phone. And unless you're holding your phone, may, maybe that holding your phone itself is what's going to save you because they know they're being watched. But they're going to go after people who they think are vulnerable, and that's not... It's not right. So their app and their phone would, it's not going to do anything. You need a live uh, camera and you need to stream it and it needs to be completely independent of a phone. Um, the other oh. issue as well is um, when police were actually trying to look for me and my, with my husband, they actually called Lyft and Lyft was not helpful at all. They did not give a driver license um, number, a you know, license plate number. They they didn't even a name or anything. They wouldn't give the police any information. Yeah, when I was with the police, um, we we contacted Lyft and they were they didn't, we weren't helpful at all. Um, I would assume like everyone else, when you ride in a Lyft, uh, you're tracked by GPS. So my like quickly, I thought like, okay, the police can call them. They can just track this guy and find them like that, but um, they called Lyft and they wouldn't provide any information except for the information that we already had, which was like the color of the car. Um, no license plate. No license. And then it, frust it frustrated me. I was angry about it. And the police officer I was with when he was talking to her on the phone, um, he was frustrated too. And that shows a lot that they're not really trying to be... a they're not trying to address those issues mm -hmm. when there's something like that happening. Another thing, actually, um, I had to contact Lyft myself to make what happened to me even aware to them two days later. They had no idea. They were not alerted that their driver was arrested. They were not alerted of the situation whatsoever. And I think that's pretty ridiculous. Could I address one more thing about about the app? And and I, I'd like to say th this isn't rocket science. This, rather than initiate useless uh, customer uh, techniques that they can do once an assault s starts, why not prevent these assaults from beginning in the first place? You know how many of our clients are here today and are in our complaint that had to fight off their attacker after the assault has begun? Do you think those women still have not been traumatized and, and that won't um, have seared memories on them for the rest of their lives? No. The, once an attack and an assault starts, trauma starts. And um, Lyft could prevent these assaults from happening rather than initiate some ridiculous feature on their app that once an assault starts, you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. What is Lyft's policy in regard to getting information with 
Um, that's a great question. And if you, if, if anybody here is aware, one of the things that the Congressional Subcommittee asked LIF was what, is, what are your policies in regard, to, um, in regard to that? And, you know, they refused to respond, which tells you something about their, their commitment to safety. Uh, we don't know what, uh, what LIF's policies are in regard to cooperation with the police. But what we do know is that in some cases, the police have to go to get a court order in order to get information about the drivers. And we know what happened here in this case where uh, police are actively trying to find a woman that's been imprisoned by, by a Lyft driver, and Lyft doesn't provide any information to the police. So that tells you a little bit about some of their policies or lack of them. What are your, any of the ladies that received response from Lyft, either uh, an apology, a response, or an acknowledgement of what happened? None at all. Zero response no. from the company? Yeah. Response, no, no email, apology. no apology, no callback, no nothing. In fact, they um, when my friend um, when my friend contacted Lyft, they said that the driver will will be taken out of their platform. But currently, the profile looks exactly the same. So your driver's profile is still on. The yes. Platform? So we don't. We have no idea. And he's he was actually he was actually released from jail four days after the incident. So we don't know. Mm -hmm. And you will also see in our complaint talks about women that were told by Lyft that the driver was taken off the platform, and yet they see them driving in a Lyft vehicle sometime we after. We can't hear you if you're that far with the mic. I'm sorry, what did you say? You said One of the things you, you can read about in our complaint is the fact that some of our clients were told by Lyft after their assault or rape that that particular driver was being taken off the app and off the platform but they later saw those drivers in Lyft vehicles still driving. Do you have a number of survivors as well who the police weren't involved with this? Is this is because um, the end of the story can be our, our, the police were involved at the end. Um, can you tell us about those survivors as well who aren't here? Um, that are not here right. in front of me? Well, in terms of the ones who didn't have police involvement in here um, or were, Well, I mean, one of the problems that we have in these cases and that the police has in these cases is we're not able to get information from Lyft. Um, many of you have sent me messages today asking me, well, can you give me the full name of, of this driver that was involved in this incident? Well, we don't know the full name of the driver. The, our, our clients want to know the full names of those drivers. Many of our clients that are part of this lawsuit want to go to court to get a restraining order because they fear for their life that this driver knows where they live and they want to be sure that this driver knows that they're not allowed to go near them. They try to get a restraining order, ask the information from Lyft. Lyft doesn't give them any information. And, you know, we know that the experiences of the police are, are very similar. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, sure. <laughs> well, I, I, so I'm a victim advocate, and I've heard more of these stories than you would ever want to, um, and they never... Um, get easier to hear, and I want to add that, you know, some women do not feel comfortable coming forward to the police because once you've been violated by not just a person, but an entity, Lyft, something you are paying for to get you somewhere safely. Once you've been violated by someone you thought you should trust, it's not a very um, comforting feeling when then you feel like you have to go retell a story to another entity or agency who might not take it seriously especially if you've been sexually assaulted before and have had negative experiences with police. So it's a very, very personal choice to report to the police. So you will see several stories um, in the lawsuit about women who decided not to come forward because, again, it is a personal choice. And I'll add, one, I'll add one more thing about the police investigations is that oftentimes our clients report that they've been groped or they've been sexually assaulted and uh, they report it to the police, and the police sit on it because they say they don't have any evidence. Well, now, if Lyft videotaped or audio recorded what goes on in the cars, would that be happening? Mm -hmm. Clearly, it would not be. The, the police would have that information, and sexual predators would be able to be taken out of these vehicles and off the street. But, but that's just not what's happening right now.
what degree did Lyft do background checks on its drivers to ascertain risk? Lyft, well, <laughs> another another interesting question. We know that Lyft does background checks and we hear what they say that they do on their website. What we also know is that people with criminal backgrounds are driving for Lyft. So the extent of the, the criminal background checks are, are unknown. We do know that the most foolproof way to do background checks is with fingerprinting, and Lyft refuses to do that. 